Today, we welcome content creator, outdoor enthusiast, entrepreneur, and author and illustrator of the incredible new book, Grow, How Nature Can Restore Balance in a Busy World. It's Joe Sugg. Hello, thanks for having me. Oh, thank you so much for coming on and for your beautiful book. And we're really excited because you're going to be our cover star for issue 67 of Happiful Magazine. So we're going to do things a bit differently today with you, if that's okay, Joe. Of course, yeah. We're going to start off by asking you how you're doing right now and what kind of place or headspace do you find yourself in as we go into autumn 2022? I'm in a good headspace at the moment. I do you know what? For me, when the seasons change, and I'm, I'm very fortunate that I have this. I've always seen myself as a bit of like a, a sun seeker. Like whenever it's good weather, it instantly puts me in a good mood. But I also have this thing that when the seasons do change and we do go into those kind of like more darker evenings and, you know, the weather's not normally as good, I still look forward to it. I think by the end of summer, I'm always like, right, I'm ready for autumn and winter now. I'm actually quite excited for for the seasons to change, the, the trees to change, and then and the, the, the sort of darker evenings to creep in. And then by the end of the sort of wintry months, I'm then also so ready for the summer months as well. So it's, and it's, it's quite nice that that's one thing that I can always know in myself isn't going to change is that sort of that excitement for for that change, if that makes sense. Yeah, that change through the seasons and what the different seasons bring to you. And even more so now, I mean, we just mentioned that you have a new book, Grow Out, and a major part of that is nature and life around us. Tell us about how this book came about. Tell us what it's about and why it was important for you to produce it in this format, a beautiful book. The initial sort of idea of it came from about two years ago when we were, you know, we were allowed that one walk a day, you know, and we and and any sort of form of outdoor space or just being I think it really sort of put into, into perspective for me you know how much more I appreciated that one walk a day when we were actually allowed to leave our our flats apartments houses um and go for a walk and you really just wanted to make the most of that that time and, and I think it's sort of highlighted how important things like that are actually are for human beings and it, especially for me and, and uh and so and then I actually I think in that same same time, we're all sort of looking for new hobbies and things like that. And I had a small little outdoor space off my lounge, which turned into the garden project. And so I, I ended up sort of making terrariums and and just sort of putting my care and thought into plants and um, sort of nature. I think I really sort of had a change of mind of like going back to how important that is for us. And, and it, it played a massive role in for me over the last two years of dealing with what we sort of went through so I looked into it a bit more and uh, and discovered that yeah nature is and always has been so important for for humans and especially for for mental health and um and well-being so uh so yeah the book is kind of like a it's a, it's a part memoir part practical guide there's a lot of stories I tell about my uh, growing up in the countryside and how without even really realizing back then it played quite a big role into into what I do talk about in the book and also, yeah, a practical guide on, and it's sort of like, I guess, like an entry level for for a lot of people to sort of hopefully figure out ways in which they can sort of find that nice balance between the, the busy online social media world and also the natural world, which, which, which we live in. And one of the things that I really love about it is the fact that you are very open about how the two things can sit alongside offline and online. It tipped over so that your life was a little more online and you've redressed that balance. Yeah. How important was that for you? Because you talk about addiction, maybe phone addiction at one point. Yeah, no, it, it was really important. I think um, I'm, I, I guess I'm like a, a key example of someone who has even, I mean, you look online and you can you can watch back the, the moment I sort of started my um, online journey because um, it's obviously all documented there online and so you can see how over the last 10 years how involved I've been in that space and you know how much of it although it's been my career uh, and still is it's one of those careers where it can consume you and it's, it's one of those jobs where that the more you put in the more you you gain out of it and I think sort of being your own boss in that space for me it got me into a bit of a over time, a bit of a tricky situation. There's times where I absolutely loved it. And I was like, Do you know what, this is this is the way forward. This is amazing. And I, you know, to a degree, I still believe that like, social media is still a massive part of, of what I do and, and a big part of my life and always will be. Um, but for me, I, I, I've sort of realized that finding that balance between the two is, is so much more important. 
and like I said, I, I, by no means am I sort of slamming social media, saying we should we should abandon it, and it's it's you know it's the devil. It definitely isn't. It's 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 helping us all stay connected. I think even during the last two years, the fact that we had choice of what app to use or what service to use to stay in contact with family and friends from around the world, it just sort of shows how important that was. It'd be interesting to sort of see what would have happened in the last two years if we didn't have social media. So it definitely plays a massive role, but it was just for me, finding that balance between the two um, was really, really important and uh, and has, has sort of worked wonders for me. And I'm, and as well in the book, I've, I've, I've give a bit of advice, but it's, it's hard to give advice when you're not an expert it's just sort of like talking about what I experienced and what worked for me and and hopefully within that there's something in there that maybe my audience or whoever buys the book can sort of resonate with and and it might be able to help them as well but yeah there's definitely there's definitely a lot of there's a lot of stuff in there that I haven't really sort of spoken about online before and I feel like it's easier sometimes to get your thoughts and words down in actual old school word form rather than sort of talking to a, to a camera about it sometimes I, I do talk about the phone addiction I, I mean I there was definitely a period of my life where I spent too much of my time scrolling through what everyone else was doing and just absorbing constantly absorbing information and by the end of that day I would then sort of go to bed and think well what actually did I do today that was actually productive and helpful and all the things I did consume and and scroll past I can't remember now so it's like, so then you sort of sat there, you know, in bed just thinking, I've I've actually wasted an entire day. At the time, it was like these quick little dopamine hits and stuff. But by the end of it, it's not stuff that stayed with me. And it's stuff that you sh- sometimes you'll find a funny video and you'll share it with your friends, which which is fun. And that gives you a little dopamine hit of like not only having a laugh looking at the content or enjoying it, but also then that feeling of sharing it with someone else is, is nice. But I think on the grander scheme of things, it's it. For me, it wasn't as fulfilling. And so I was like, I need to do something. I'm not really someone as well that's addicted to anything else. So so for me, I found it very hard to actually sort of be, I think I'm addicted to my phone. Like, And I think, you know, I think a lot of people are and people that ne- aren't, don't necessarily have an addiction problem in their life or didn't don't have that sort of trait or tendency. But I think it's, it's still, for me, that's what was surprising was that it kind of like slipped under the radar. And, I, and all of a sudden I was like, hang on a minute. This is, I think if I showed my like phone habits of like how much I spend scrolling, someone would say that probably is, you know, an addiction. So yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. But um, it's all stuff that I think we can sort of look at and work on and just try and find that balance that works for for everyone. You won't be alone with with mm. phone addiction as well. And it's so prevalent as well you know we all use them every day for a million different things you yeah. only have to go on the tube or on a bus and you'll see people using them so I understand why it's it's perhaps hard to come to the realization that you know this could be an addictive behavior going on yeah. and you you talk really openly about the fact that you started to introduce things like limits on your apps but you found that hard and and it made me laugh because you said that you would you would hit the snooze and the same day that I read your book I'd done the same thing yeah three times before I just hit the button that says remove all limits for today so do you see it around you people using their phones now that you're aware of what you were doing even before I addressed it within myself I noticed it in my peers and other people as well um and I think I don't know whether it's I've got like a bit of a slight old-fashionedness to me I don't know but I was I would sort of be like like I think especially like meal times and stuff we'd always play that sort of phones in the middle game where the first person to touch their phone had to pick up the bill and um for me I was always like that I I I was very good in those situations of being like there's no way like I would there's no way I'm picking up this bill I'm not going to reach my phone and it wasn't even because I didn't want to pay. It was more because I just knew I've got that sort of willpower. If, if you know, if I'm told not to do something, I won't do it. And I'll, so, but for other people, it was, it's, it was amazing to sort of see how quickly they forget. And it, it was so like, I think we're so programmed to, if there's a, if there's a down period of time where we're not doing anything, our in, instinct now is to reach for our phone, to fill that void of just silence and, and in a way, awkwardness. Like I, I think I mentioned as well in the book about standing in line at a supermarket and you, you sort of, whenever you a waiting period or a time where you've got to wait, our, our instinct is now to reach for our phone. And that's 
not necessarily a bad thing because it you know I don't think we should always be sat there like this just looking around just doing nothing but sometimes that is that can be good for us I think just to have a time of like not actually taking anything in and just letting your brain rest for a bit but also you know I think if it depends on what you're filling that time with if it is just endless scrolling for the sake of it that's probably not going to help I don't think in the long term or even the short term depends on what you're sort of doing with that with that time with, and with your phone if it's like replying to emails or doing something productive that's going to make you feel better uh work-wise or you know if it's reaching out to a friend that you've not spoke to for a while then obviously that's very like you know that that makes sense but for me I was just I was filling my time with scrolling through stuff and I wasn't even like taking it in that I was in a queue for things scrolling through uh TikTok or Instagram and I was just doing it as like a habit thing rather than a I need to look for something I need to do this or do that it was it's very very weird you make such a good point there about the fact that we will very quickly turn to our phones to fill those gaps those moments where we might actually just be our minds might be wandering or we might be observing people around us and I think there's a really good reason that so many people say they come up with amazing thoughts in the shower they come up with Mm -hmm. amazing ideas in the shower it's because there is nothing else to do apart from obviously you're washing yourself but your mind will wonder and and another part of the book, you talk about the fact you've now moved to the countryside and and people yes. will come and visit you and you'll go for a walk together and there'll be silence, but it's not awkward. Can you tell us a bit about that move and, and how that shifted your perception of spending time doing nothing? Yeah. Um, so, yes, we moved. Uh, it was during uh, just before the third lockdown started. So. We were, we were very lucky in a way that our third lockdown, which I think for most people that I speak to, they're like, that was the worst one because it was like, everyone was so over it by then. And um, we were very lucky because we just, we just moved. So we had a lot of things to do. Like obviously for a lot of people, it wasn't, but for us, it was quite an exciting time because we had just moved to the countryside and it had been a long, long time coming. We've been looking for a while and uh, just being able to have that sort of a bit more outdoor space and, 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 that kind of definitely helps there's loads of good like walking routes as well around here and things which massively massively helped and I think in in London I still had uh, my local park which is Battersea Park which is massive a lovely like a lovely park close by and I could walk on the river to get there and it was a really really lovely walk that's what I sort of realized as well during lockdown how important like I think I took that walk for granted a lot of the time or that run through Battersea Park was always sort of taken a bit for granted and I think then from moving down to this place, it made me appreciate it even more about like how we are surrounded by nature, even if it doesn't feel like it in a city or something. We still are, you, can, you know, a short, a short um, bus ride away or a train ride away and you can be within sort of nature. And I think that move for us certainly helped in a way, slow my mind down a bit, slow things down a bit and make me, make me sort of have a bit of like a, I don't know, just made me a lot more calmer with like what I was with my direction of what I was doing in life and work and sort of getting out of that sort of the busyness of London, I think sort of helped me, helped me a lot, sort of just have a bit more clarity on what it was I wanted to do going forward. Like I've had uh, an amazing sort of 10, 10 years on, on, on social media and YouTube and stuff, which I still, you know, I still, I'm still on those platforms. I'm, I'm not going away anytime soon, but obviously I'm just sort of, for me, it was the start of like a new chapter of my life. And so, yeah, it was, it's, uh, it came at the right time. I think, I think I'm, I'm 30 now as well. So like, I feel like I'm at that age where maybe you appreciate that stuff more. Cause I, I look back on when I was a young, a youngster and um, I definitely didn't appreciate as much, especially not sort of publicly verbally in front of my mates being like, Oh, look how nice this is like this nature. You know, it's not the sort of thing you do. I don't think as a young child. So uh, it was, it wasn't like the cool thing to, to do. You wanted to be in the town with your mates, not, out in the fields and, and the woodlands and stuff. But I think deep down, I absolutely loved it. But it's something that I've sort of now gone back to. Now that I'm 30, I, I appreciate it a lot more. feels like turning 30 and the pandemic kind of collided in in quite a big moment for you of re-evaluation. I think so. I think, and I think for a lot of people as well, I mean, a, a lot of people that I've spoken to, it's been a real sort of couple of years of self-reflection and sort of a lot of people have you know completely changed career a lot of people have started new careers during during the pandemic which they've gone on to become really successful in and and um, really enjoyed it's definitely a time of 
of sort of self-reflection and thinking like you know what what is it that that I want and what is it that you know people that watch me and what do they want and just trying to find like a a middle ground that suits suits both I think it's been an interesting couple of years but yeah I've definitely I'm definitely more more relaxed out here you know <laughs> it's it's definitely a lot um a lot better for me I think being out in the countryside that's wonderful to hear and you do talk about anxiety and overwhelm and also just overload with how your mm. career was before you share how your sister Zoe had managed anxiety before and lived with anxiety so you knew what that was like did you yeah. seek professional help for your anxiety or did you get outside help at all uh, I did actually well I was, I was I was very lucky in a sense that my sister had her own sort of issues with anxiety so I was very lucky that I had someone within my family that I could speak to about it mm-hmm. very like, openly. Um, but also a lot of my friends as well around at the time, they were all as well. I was quite fortunate that I think through social media and, and YouTube and things like that, that kind of space has always been quite open. I think with like where I grew up and the environment I grew up in, it wasn't really discussed and spoken about this is going back I mean I, I finished school in 2010 I think this is I finished sixth form at that time and even around then it wasn't discussed at all and that's not even going back you know that's 2010 that's only 12 years ago so I think nowadays though I, I really do think that it has become a lot much more of an open uh, more discussed conversation which I think is absolutely incredible and and because even going back yeah like I said going back to when I was at school it wasn't discussed and talked about yeah so I was very fortunate as well that I think from being through going through YouTube and being around a lot of other creators who were very open about sharing their lives as well online that also helped a lot as well so I had I had a lot of people that I could talk to about it and we're all kind of in this same bubble uh, with me and my sort of YouTube peers we're all in the same bubble of we're all going through this very unusual career path together we're all working things out we're all um you know, learning like new things about it every day. There's no clear outcome and ending for the career path that we've chosen or sort of stumbled into because we didn't even sort of choose it knowing that it would get to a certain level. It's very much a kind of, in this industry, there's no one that's sort of got to a level where we can be like, ah, that's what I want to achieve and do. It was very much, we were living it there and then, which was very interesting, very new. We weren't used to it. And, um, but what was great was that there was a lot of us in a group together that we could have very open conversations about how we were feeling and and you know any sort of issues and struggles and stuff it was very and also like we did have good support from the social media companies themselves like we've got I was very lucky to have a partner manager at YouTube still do now to this day who's always been very very supportive and always been there if you need a chat and if there's, if there's issues you have with the platform or things you think they can improve on, we've sort of got someone that we can someone that we can speak to there, which is which has always been re- very 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 helpful. And even actually with this book, my my partner manager reached out and sort of said, I think it's wonderful, you know, what you're doing with the book, and and that's coming from the social media, you know, side of things. So it's it just it just shows that that we I've been very lucky to have the support that that I've had. And there's a lot of people out there that that won't get that support or they don't feel comfortable sort of reaching out for that support but I I do think we're you know as the years are going on it is becoming a more and more talked about topic and um, it's much more accepted I do have professional um, therapy uh, still now into this day because I I find it as a sort of I've never seen it as a as a stigma to sort of say that I've got a therapist even speaking to my my friends from from back home um you know, I've all, I've always been very open about it, and and it's never been met with a what like, what do you mean like? It's never been met with anything negative. It's always been like, oh cool, I'd I'd love to do that. I think as the years go on, it's, it's going to become more and more accessible to everybody, hopefully. Um, and when it does, I I see it as like, uh, and, and a lot of people say this before, it's like it's like going to the gym, but for your mind. So it's it's not even it's not even to say that you've got something that you feel is wrong with you or anything like that. It's not about that. It's more about going to see a therapist and talking about stuff actually just it's just like yes it's like a workout for the mind which you know the mind is the most powerful thing in our bodies it makes sense to treat it like you would treating a muscle going to the gym I think so I think I think I think it's really important and I think yeah like I said hopefully in the future I think the way things are going it is become more accessible to the wider public and I think it's something that we could all benefit from. 
Jo, I couldn't agree more. And I'm so pleased that you've shared that as well. Obviously, at Happiful, one of the things that we are committed to is breaking down the stigma around seeking mental health support and also sharing the the many, many ways you can do that from seeking private counselling to the NHS, which we know is under strain, but also the charities that are out there as well. And I think to hear people talking about it as easily as you just have is so important because there is still such a stigma that if you go to see a therapist, it's something that you can't say to people, actually, I can't make that because I'm going to see my therapist. How did you go about finding one? Because I think that's another thing. There's a big mystery around how do you find a therapist? Once again, I was quite fortunate that I, because of people that I knew, they were already, so it's free recommendation. So I knew people that had seen various different therapists. So I sort of tried, trialed and errored and and finally settled on one that that I felt worked really well for me. And and so, yeah, so a, a lot of the time it was through like word of mouth of like friends or family who spoke to them. But it's like you said, there's, you know, there's there's a lot of charities out there that the reason they're there is to help people. And I think sometimes we can sort of forget about that as an option in a way. And it's, and it's not, you know, the, those people, they're there to help people find the help that they need places like that are obviously really really good but yeah I think um, there's there's now more ways than ever to to find someone that that you work well with that's going to be the right fit and I think we've got to also realize as well that you're not necessarily going to find the right person for you straight away it is a bit of like a you know it can be a bit of a trial and error process of finding someone who you really understand the way they in way which they work and I think it's got to work work both ways but once you found that as well I've got to stress as well. It doesn't, it's not a quick fix as well by doing this. It's something that you're going to have to to work on and make it part of your routine because you're not going to have one session and leave thinking, oh my word, you know, there'll be, there'll be little things that will really, really help, but it is a long process. Like Rome wasn't built in a day, like that kind of thing of like, if you're really that keen to help yourself and get yourself to a place you want to be, you will stick at something to achieve that. You know, if you want to get an amazing physique in the gym, you're not going to go and expect to get it in one gym session. You've got to dedicate your time and efforts to it for a long period of time to see the results. And then you'll look back and it's it's those kind of small incremental changes that all add up over the long, you know, the long period of time that are going to help way more than one session could. And I think the analogy of the, you know, if you're trying to build a physique or anything, yeah. there's there's going to be things that take a long period of time. And one of the things that I, going back to your book, really like about your book is it's it's a love letter to the things we can do alongside therapy that are quite instant. Yeah. So getting out in nature. Yeah, exactly. And it and it does kind of tie in as well with this sort of social media world we're now living in, where we we almost have an expectation of things to be done super quick. We want things as fast as possible. Like I remember when my phone first had internet and things would just take for web. I wouldn't go on the internet on my phone because it just took so long to load anything. And I'm, I'm a gamer as well. I've grown up playing computer games. And now when I play games, if I ever see a loading screen, if I ever go back and play an old game, I'm like, I can't believe I used to wait this long for a level to load on a computer game. Like we're just, we're now so used to getting information at the touch of a button now on our phones. And we're living in an age where we want everything so instantly. And sometimes it is good to just every now and then have things in your life where you know you're not necessarily going to get that quick, instant result. It is all right to to sort of have hobbies and do things that, that take time and, and take, you know, take a long time to to get the results that you want. Because then you look back on it and it actually feels, for me, it feels more earned in a way and more it's a, a nice feeling that comes with it I kind of link it back to like when I was a roof thatcher um, that job was all about you know it would be at least six weeks to do a roof um, so it's six weeks just working on one roof the same roof that, that whole at least six weeks and then but the, that feeling you get when you finally sort of step back and you, you sort of look at what you've spent the last six weeks making for somebody else as well it's very it's such a special feeling which I always say I'd love to be able to bottle up that feeling and dish it out to people because it is I think we need to sort of bring an element of that back into our lives or at least just acknowledge that those things are still still hold a lot of value to us as as humans they really do and it, it reminds me of gardening 
because it's it's quite often it's not going to be immediately gratifying you know you might have to sit and look at a bare garden for a long period of time till the next spring or but you talk in your book about your garden and how you can imagine it in 10 years time what is it that gardening does for you exactly kind of like what what I mentioned about the the roof you and it's a, a good point you brought up is it's the same thing of like it's essentially like a you start off with a, a bit of a blank canvas and you've got to have you, you know it's very trial and error it has its highs and its lows but it's something that you can put your time and effort in that's not going to give you instant satisfaction and reward it's something something that the more you sort of care for and look after the more you're going to get the results from and and look back on it and think I, I I did that I made this garden even when I was living in London just having that sort of just growing anything uh, or just looking after house plants and, and trying to keep them alive and, and giving your care to something else and putting time and effort into something else and not necessarily seeing results straight away is is very I think it's, I think it's so good for us to sort of have in our lives and so for me gardening has definitely become one of those things I'm still very much in the trial and error stage of gardening there's a lot of things that I applied this year that I, I'm probably never going to see or they didn't last as long as they'd like. And But it's all stuff that we're sort of learning in the moment as well. I, although I do use social media sometimes to, to get information that I need of learning what's what and tips and advice. But at the end of the day, the best advice sort of comes down from trying it yourself and it completely failing or it taking off and being like, ah, oh, so that grew really well this year. I'm going to do that again next year. But try and do more of it do you know what I mean it's it's one of those kind of things gardening and it and it's also a time where although you, you might have your phone close on you, you I find time goes can go in the blink of an eye but you get you can get so much done and you sort of and you've had a, a good a break from being plugged into the to the online online world and I always have that feeling of satisfaction afterwards of like you don't need to constantly have your notifications on your alerts on and your phone on even on loud or even with you when you're out in the garden or doing something in, in nature, I think anyway. I agree. And I love the fact that there's a kind of, there's such a, a juxtaposition between your phones and the screens that you kind of need to keep clean. You need to have yeah. clean hands or whatever and having yeah. dirty fingers when you've been digging. And you mentioned that you said we both or we moved down. I should say that you moved with your partner, Diane, yeah. who yeah. you mention is also a country girl at heart, having yeah. grown up. So is she lovely? the garden as well as she pursuing nature in the same way so she, it's it's funny because yeah, she's from um like a small sort of the outskirts of a small town in australia so i guess it's kind of a kind of like an australian version of the countryside in a way but it's still very very different from the british countryside um but yeah no she's i think because she's a professional dancer on strictly come dancing so she loves where we are we, we're both really really like happy to be in, out in the countryside she loves um long walks which is great uh hikes all that kind of stuff like um so, which which is really really nice i think on terms of the gardening front she is a lot more interested now that she's got her own vegetable patch where she can grow her own lettuce and and rocket and spinach and stuff because she's very into her sort of health and fitness and, and things like that but i think in terms of like the actual gardening stuff i don't think she's on the same sort of page as me but she loves seeing what I've done though and like sort of being out in the garden and being outside but I think with her work at the moment and with dancing and stuff that at the moment is still like a priority for her and and so she just hasn't got really got time to sort of when she is home I don't think she's got the time to to get the gloves on and and do a bit of gardening herself but but also it's kind of like I've become quite protective of my garden as well so I'm, I'm kind of like oh no because it's sometimes she loves to rearrange all our house plants to make to change the rooms around and make the rooms look different and i'll come back and i'm like yeah but the thing is although that looks nice there it's not getting the right sunlight there so it's not gonna and so we have that we have those little back and forth sometimes um which is always fun but um but yeah i think it's definitely something that she's gonna get into i think whether she likes it or not i'm gonna make her get be a a gardener but her mum is also a very very keen gardener so i actually instantly bonded with with her parents over gardening actually and sort of like i guess like my knowledge of UK gardening crossed with Australian gardening because 
I get quite jealous because they got they get they can essentially grow house plants outside in their gardens out there because it gets so hot. And whereas over here we've got completely different gardening methods and plants and stuff which they absolutely love when they're over here. So but, which has been really fun. I actually gave them a little bit of plot of garden out the front and been like, right, what? Because they can stay with us for for a few weeks this summer. And I said, right, Rena and Mark, this is your bit of garden. You can do whatever you want. There's a garden center down there. You can go down there and, and sort of make this your own garden, little garden project, which is really fun. Um, I love that. Yeah. I love that you've created a shared space for for different people. So Diane's got her veg patch. Their parents had their own patch. That's It just shows how much of a conversation gardening can start, but also how it can be joyful to share it with other people. Yeah, uh, we're, we're lucky now that where we are, we've got a, a quite a good sized garden. It's quite it's quite a large garden. So there is like a lot of um, there's a lot of room for I mean, it's, it's been nice actually being here sort of the last two years. We've not really done too much to the garden because we've been interested to sort of see for a year what naturally grows where and just try and work out where, the, where we get the light and where we don't where we get more light and things like that so it's but it's um but we're, we're lucky that we've got the space to, to to sort of do do stuff like that but even if you don't i think um there's there's easy there's i mentioned the book there's 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 ways in which you can sort of figure out find like shared spaces and like community gardens and things and and just to go along there you'll meet people that will have a lot of knowledge that they can sort of pass down to you and and it can be a good way of getting into the the hobby of gardening that's wonderful joe we're coming to the end of our podcast and usually when we do the i am i have format i ask people at the end of the podcast if they could meet themselves on a park bench 10 years from now what do they hope their future self would say to them but for this one i'd love to ask you if you were stood in your garden with joe in 10 years from now so 40 year old joe what does it look like and what does joe say to you older joe say to you well the garden itself will be um like a bit of a journey so like i can imagine you're sort of walking down because the garden's on a slope as well so i can imagine i'd like there to be almost like different areas going down the garden that really captures people's imaginations. I think that's a big part of what I want to achieve with the garden is to kind of compartmentalize it and almost have like rooms within the garden that are all different, sparks something different in people's imagination when they walk through it. So I do like the idea of having the sort of idyllic kind of Peter Rabbit style allotment. You know, I, I, I think that's definitely an important part. That's something that we're sort of really into at the moment is sort of growing up our own fruit and vegetables um but also having a uh some form of I, I like the idea of having a pond as well with a little pond house that's like something you see out of like a I don't know, like an Enid Blyton book or something like very sort of characteristic type of thing with a with a thatched roof that I'm going to thatch myself um hopefully but yeah lots of different areas that sort of I think I'd love to have uh an area that's sort of quite Australian not very like too obvious but like slight Australian vibes to it one that's sort of more like where I grew up in in Wiltshire and that kind of thing lots of different spots um, to sit throughout the garden as well and just sort of get lost within I think that's the kind of that's what I how I picture it very kind of uh, yeah Enid Blytony meets Nanny McPhee type there's kind of things that you that the kind of garden that as a child I would have that would I would have been really excited to go and explore I think and I think speaking to 40 year old Joe I think he'd tell me that it's it's gonna take a long time it's gonna be very expensive probably <laughs> um, but it's gonna be something I think it's gonna be a space it's become a space that you're immensely proud of um, and it has become a, a, a like a your own escape from from reality a place where you can go a safe space where you can go and, and entertain guests and have friends around and also create a space that can be used by by friends and family as well and it's you know a, a, a place that you're very very proud of that's lovely that sounds like a really nice conversation and a garden I'd really like an invite to in 10 years yes please, Joe. yeah definitely definitely <laughs> <laughs> sounds beautiful Joe. thank you so much tell everyone again the name of your book and also where they can find you online yes uh the name of the book is grow it's available everywhere I think pretty much most places bookstores online and you can find me on every well all, all sorts really YouTube Instagram TikTok I'm, I'm on them all I just I don't post as <laughs> as regularly as I as I used to, but um, but I am still on there, um, and it is still the place where you can find me. 
make sure you grab that book because it's an absolute delight. Joe, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Lucy.